great grandma. We were, I was, we were sitting at the funeral, and you know, we all have these memories of church and faith and, and whatnot, and how they relate. And I think the more I grow up in faith, the more I start remembering all of these little nuggets throughout my life that God kind of planted that have been, that, that are memories for me, but really shouldn't be. If that makes sense. Like, it was, it was the smallest thing becomes one of the greatest memories. One of the things I remember is in, at my grandma's funeral, um, the pastor was sitting down with the family and saying, you know, tell me about uh, Laureen. Tell, tell me about uh, her. What, how do you remember her? And one of the things that came up at, in discussion was she had the world's best scrambled eggs. And everybody sat there and agreed. They all talked about how great the scrambled eggs were. And the pastor said, he just kind of sat there and listened, thinking, they're scrambled eggs. How good can they be? Like, everybody likes scrambled eggs, but can they really be like the world's best scrambled eggs? I mean, they're just the plain eggs. You didn't put nothing really in them. Just, they were the best. And, and I think uh, what he come down to when he was get preparing the service, he's like, how do I tell people that she's remembered by her scrambled eggs? <laughs> and it wasn't necessarily the scrambled eggs that were delicious, it was her love. Because they're made with love. She enjoyed getting up and making everybody breakfast. And, and so love was the perfect ingredient. On a more relatable level, I mean, you may have a family member who just is an amazing cook. It doesn't matter what they cook, it's great. <clears throat> um, but uh, throughout uh, the cartoon SpongeBob SquarePants, there's two, pe there's two people in this world. You either love it or you hate it. Either way, throughout it, there is this uh, um, guy named Plankton who's always trying to steal a secret recipe. Yeah. And forever and ever, for uh, as long as the show's been going, it's always been a secret. And they didn't really tell you, but it does eventually come out that the secret to the cat patty is love. And that's why they're so good, because SpongeBob makes them. And he absolutely loves it. And so he takes great care, passion, and he puts all his love into it. And so I, I hit that up because we're going to, over the next, I don't know, 13 weeks, if I decide to stop there, we're going to go over the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' like, foundation. It's, it's early, kind of early in his ministry. And at the end of it, it says, everybody was amazed how he talked with such authority. Because it wasn't that he came and taught some kind of philosophy, but it was a declaration. And it was authoritative. But it was also extremely wise. And it fit with everything they believed in the doctrine and everything. So, and so, what it was, was is it's his love. These are not, he didn't say any truth that hasn't already been taught. Well, maybe a little bit. He said, I would say, he might have exaggerated compared to what other teachers at the time. But he had a sincere love for those he's preaching to. And he was declaring his truth to them. And it was it was of the utmost importance. And so the entire foundation of his entire life, as it was lived out, the example that he set, everything he taught is all within this one sermon of his. The rest of it is just him sharing the cake, right? He's leading by example and continuing to share the same message in different ways to different people and to others who haven't heard it. But this one, this one is so important and so pivotal in the life of Christ because it, it actually has everything he's ever taught in it, as well as the example that he provided. So before we get into it, I'd just like to open up in prayer. Uh, over this word. And then if you have your Bibles with you, just bookmark Matthew 5, we're going to be there for a little while. Well, I mean, we'll, go into, we'll go into 6 and 7, eventually. But it'll be a progression. We're going to be here for a while. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and this word that you give us. We thank you for Jesus Christ and the ministry that he has for us, both in his word and his actions as an example, and ultimately as a sacrifice. Or uh, the song was so powerful that we're thankful for the scars. We're thankful for his scars that remind us who he is. The Son of God, the Messiah, the suffering servant, the one who's resurrected. When we see those scars, 
and others have seen those scars, personal testimonies, seen those scars as a sign of his resurrection. And we know that by that sign, we are saved by faith through him. And we, we thank you immeasurably for that. But what does that mean for us? Help us to be inspired to know how that transforms us. As we move into this new year with New Year's resolutions, the new year, new me. Or how that be true to us. Let us start from inside. Let us be cleansed from the inside. Transform the inside. So that the outside may reflect your righteousness. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I hope you got your thinking caps on because you're going to get learned today. I'm going to do the best I can at doing some teaching at the same time as preaching. But you would think they're the same, but they're not. First, this starts up with a, we often come to call it the Beatitudes or the Beatitudes. I think the sermon starts right there. In the, I think before we get into the, the Beatitudes, we need to kind of preface what they are. So the Beatitudes or the Beatitudes, where do you want to go? It comes from the Latin word Beatitudes, which means blessed. Right, so, so we tend to use them as like the attitudes, like, like B, like the letter B, like they all start with blessed or blessed, however you want to pronounce it. They're all they all start with blessed, and so that's how I remember them. Like, oh, the B attitudes, they all start with B, right? And and maybe they're an attitude, right? So they're like B attitudes, no, kind of, yes, but not, not but not really. But it's a great way to remember who they, what they are. And where they are, and reference and make a connection. But these are, if this Sermon on the Mount is the recipe for the perfect scrambled eggs, the Beatitudes are the ingredients list. So if you ever look at an ingredient, if you ever look at a recipe, typically there's a list of ingredients, and then the recipe follows. It's like, you're going to get all these things, so then you get them all out, get them all ready. And then it says, these are how you use these things. And that's really what this part of the sermon is. It's saying, this is the ingredients. And, of course, none of it is possible without love, right? These are just eggs. But with love, they're perfect eggs. And everybody will remember it. So, those are the beatitudes. We have to know that first. The second thing we have to know is the word bless. We live in a culture where we feel like if somebody's blessed, in fact, it's not even this culture, all around the world, if people are blessed, it's because they have something. They've been fortunate in a way that's tangible. And that kind of falls short in this Greek word. This Greek word for blessed is also the same word as happy. So blessed isn't necessarily something you possess, but it's a state of being. And so... But we have to remember that, that that being blessed isn't necessarily that you have something or something that's measurable or you attained something, but it, but it's something that's more inward. It's something that's, that's a happiness. It's a joy that you have inside of you. It's a, it's a happiness. So, so we want to think of that first, which doesn't really lead me into the next word, but I got to get there somehow. I don't really have a good transition for it, but perfect. Perfect. We, we in the holiness tradition, uh, the Wesleyan tradition, uh, celebrate uh, the doctrine of Christian perfection, which has been dangerous in some camps, because they think it's perfect in the absolute sense. John Lewis Wesley, theologian, never said it, you'd be perfect in the absolute sense, we want us perfect in the will of your heart. And so, the word perfect, the, the Greek word, uh, teleos, I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing it right. Um, to be perfect, it's also used by Paul to mean mature. So, perfect isn't like an absolute word. When, when we see this in 5, verse 48, it says, Be perfect as your, or therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. We are much like this bowl. I can, you know, maybe a rose cup had water in it, right? And then it broke. Now it no longer holds water. And so somebody has glued it together. Now it can hold water again. And we are very much like this bowl. We are broken from, in our lives. And through Christ, we can be healed and made perfect again. Is it absolutely perfect? Is it all one whole piece? No. 
But the idea of perfect in Greek, if something was perfect, it's because, it, even in the Hebrew tradition, it was still able to carry out its function. So even though we would look at this guy, it's not perfect, it's broken, it's been glued together, and so no, it's absolutely perfect because it can carry out its purpose. That's what it was made. And so throughout this whole sermon series, it's going to be all about perfection, about being perfect, and what that means and what that looks like. And I think this is one of the greatest illustrations we have so far, is this idea that we aren't perfect aesthetically, but we can still live out our purpose fully and perfectly as God intended us to. And it starts here with this, with these Beatitudes. <coughs> and so if you're, if you're there yet, if you're, if you're in there, <coughs> we are going to read. I'm going to try to read. Somehow it's got really blurry. So now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is our ingredients list. One of the things we have to remember is that these are not philosophies. This is not, oh, you'll be blessed if you're poor in spirit, and you'll receive the kingdom of heaven. This, no, no, it's declarative. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's declaring that through him, in the kingdom of heaven that's coming, you will be blessed because you are poor in spirit. You will be blessed when you are meek. You will be blessed when you mourn. You'll be blessed when you're pure in heart. Or if we change those words to happy. You will be happy when you're a peacemaker. You'll be happy when you're persecuted or suffering. But why? Why is this? Why, why is it that we would be blessed? And some of these, some of these are good. But being poor and hungry and thirsty and meek, how are those? How are those supposed to be? Remember, these are a state of being. That's a state of being happy. I wrote my notes on a hand game. Yep. <laughs> Call me Steve. <laughs> I, <got that. laughs> I think it's Joe now. Can't remember. Remember, to be perfect in Christ, to have Christian perfection, isn't necessarily to be blessed. It's to be transformed. It's the purity of heart. We may do things and fall short. We may be forgetful. We may say things unintentionally that hurt another. But what are our intentions? Where are we at heart? Can we be pure at heart? And that's where these ingredients to being perfect, and all the Christian sins are, are kind of held together by love, which is God. As John explains to us, God is love. If these are, I don't want to I'm going to backtrack a little bit. I'm thinking of a better way to say it. I had it down one way and I'm like, oh, but. So, these are broken down into a couple different categories. 
for honorable dispositions, as well as acts of mercy, peace, and justice. So they're state of being, but also states of action that flow from a pure heart. And so to live out, to live out who we are in Christ, to live out perfection, as we understand in the Wesleyan tradition, as we understand as what it means to be a Christian profession, is to live out our purpose. Not necessarily our appearance, what's on the outside, but what's on the inside. So this is where we start this new year. Think about what it means to be blessed by the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven belongs, I'm kind of rewording this a little bit, of another way to say that, but blessed by the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are humble. Blessed are those who mourn. This is an interesting one. Take time to mourn, to grieve, for yourself and with others. That's normal. I mentioned this a few weeks ago um, on love. That oftentimes grief, we grieve and we mourn, is because of love is actually what causes that feeling. So it's okay. You know, the, the more we love something that's now gone, it's taken away, the more that hurts, the more it's because of love that drives it. So be mournful. In a time of mourning. Blessed are the meek. We're more fragile than we think. And I, this, this bull here is more susceptible to breaking again than it was before. So that one means we need to take care of our faith all the more. We need to remember that we are fragile. We can be broken again. And when it happens, we'll need to be glued back together. We need to be gentle, quiet, and easy in composure. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Desire to deepen your relationship with Christ. Hunger and thirst for the Word of God. It says, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful. Forgive and be forgiven. Jesus has a lot of teaching on that to come. Blessed are the pure in heart. Keep your intentions rooted. Keep your intentions pure and rooted in love. Blessed are the peacemakers. Be concerned about justice and correct injustice. Stand up for what is right. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Do what's right. It said, those who are persecuted because of righteousness, the kingdom of theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We need to do what's right, even when others don't think it is. Blessed are you. Can't read my own chicken scratch. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you falsely, and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Heaven, eternal life, is worth being firm in what you believe in. Heaven will not belong to those who are wishy-washy. I don't know how long you could stand being in a relationship with somebody who is in and out of your life. At some point, you're going to say, either you love me or you don't. You're going to have to draw a line of sin eventually. That line's going to be drawn for you, too. Find the side and stand on it. I add it in here. Heaven is worth being firm in what you believe in. And the one who makes all of this possible. Jesus. By the love of Christ, by what he's done. As he's declaring it, he's declaring the kingdom of heaven in a lot of these because he ushers in the kingdom of heaven. It's here now, not fully, but it is here now, and we have a place in it, we have a role in it, we have a part in it. And it begins with us being these things. 
And we can only be these things because we know Christ as Lord and Savior. At least I hope you do. So as we go on in the next umpteen weeks, I'm counting 13, including this one. Unless I'm inspired to continue through Pentecost. <laughs> but right now we're just going up until Easter. But I think it's important that we remember that we can't just know that Christ saved us and then continue on with our lives. We have to be changed by it. And we, amidst the New Year's and seeing people with New Year's resolutions, walking through Walmart and seeing all of their fitness stuff in that very first aisle right when you walk in the door, <laughs> it's telling. We know it, because I just have a year. It's like a cycle. Jesus breaks the cycle of madness. It's a true transformation. But it only happens if you take it seriously. And if you believe wholeheartedly that you'll find happiness in weakness, in meekness, in mourning, in poor in spirit, when you're hungry and thirsty. When you search Christ and his things, you're blessed because of it. You're blessed, you're, you're happy, you're fortunate. You're fortunate to know and receive Christ in influence. So I ask that you join me to, in prayer for your New Year's resolution I'm giving to you, whether you want it or not. <laughs> Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ who makes things possible, who takes apart, takes up our broken pieces and glues them back together so that we can live a perfect cause for you. Lord, help me to nurture the shattered vessel I am. Tell me to be gentle with it, easy in composure, to love it and cherish it, and to maintain it. Wherever there's holes or cracks or leaks, Lord, point them out to me so that we may bend them together. And that we can be contained within us a spring of living water that overflows of your love into the world. Help us to be the people you've called us to be, not just the people who know about faith and who receive you by faith, but who live it out in practical ways in our lives. That the cleansing from the inside flows outward and into our communities. So that they know the richness of your love and your mercy. Lord, I pray that you in your love, make us to be the best scrambled eggs everybody has ever laid out.